your deed to heaven. We're going to talk about that a little bit, but indeed you do have one. And um, it hinges basically on faith. Faith is, many people say, well, I wish I had more faith. And do you really know what faith is, what it consists of, what its makeup is? It's very important that you do. Because faith, basically, when you tear down the Hebrew and the Greek, don't tear it down, but get to the very primes, it has to do, number one, with knowledge. You really can't have faith if you don't have knowledge. In other words, before you can have faith in something, you've got to have the knowledge to know what it's about. What is it? Very few human beings can really sustain themselves without faith in something. Now, it may be a person. It may be a religion. It may be just be uh, themselves. But it is necessary that man have faith in something to really exist. Naturally, a person that is observant and possesses knowledge is able to take God's letter to us and determine, hey, no man could have done this. It's our Father. Well, therefore, knowledge begins to build your platform of faith. Now, faith also is love. Probably is um, the most important ingredient. Knowledge and love but really, those words do not say it. So I think we're just going to go into the Word. And we're going to take some examples of where God placed the platform. For as it is written in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the reverence of God, the fear of God, it's kind of a fear-love thing. It's like when your father or your mother scolded you and you wanted to walk the line, you weren't exactly afraid of them, but you respected them and had been disciplined by them until that reverence was there. You wanted to please them. You wanted them to be proud of you. Well, faith also is a little bit of this. And I'll document that here in a moment. So faith is very difficult to describe in just two or three words. Because it consists of a relationship with our Father. And a relationship is filled with many things if it's complete. And certainly I hope yours is um, with him. So open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Sam First Samuel and chapter 2. Now, we've gone through the judges here, and people have tried it. They tried a king. They tried first judges, both men and women, uh, headed up Israel. Um, uh, Rebecca being one of the greatest judges there ever was. Deborah, rather, I correct myself. And, um, and a fantastic leader she was. But man cannot fulfill the obligation of governing totally and having... Uh, equal uh, status for everyone as go our own father being king can. And therefore, naturally, he looked forward to sending his son and that was a promise. Now, faith is your ability to believe beyond a doubt in the promises that he who you have faith in makes. So his promises are very important that you trust them, that you know he's going to fulfill that promise. Therefore, your faith strengthens because you know that he is our father and that he loves you and you in return love him. In, second in, um, in 1 Samuel chapter 2 here, we had a couple of boys, but they were sons of Belial, though their father certainly wasn't Belial. They just didn't love God. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to turn to that verse. To, I wasn't going to begin there, but I'm sorry. Well, we'll, we'll begin with verse 20. And um, I, I want to pick up on a word first. We'll talk about those sons of Belial here in a little bit. 
Verse 20, 1 Samuel chapter 2, a word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. It reads, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And um, I'm sorry, I want to go to verse... I'm in chapter 1. Y'all excuse me. I, I made a mistake like that four years ago. Huh. It just happens to you. Now I'm going to read about the sons of Belial here, all right? In verse 12 of chapter 2, 1 Samuel. Let's hear, hit the grand run, ground running again, all right? Okay, verse 12 reads, Now the sons of Eli, and yeah, he was a fantastic prophet and priest, were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now, that is a bad situation when you know not the Lord. And uh, now we're going to go to these two in verse 34 of chapter 2. I apologize if I've confused anyone else other than myself. So um, we'll pick this up then with verse 34. And this shall be a sign unto thee. Do you know what a sign should be to you? It's a signal. It means it's something you want to put in your bonnet and keep it there for a reserve to draw upon as a type. This is a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni, that's to say a scrapper or a boxer, a fighter, and Phinehas, which is to say brazen mouth. In one day they shall die, both of them. Do you, you know what their sin was? They ripped people off in preacher's robes. I mean, they had no mercy on when they put their hook in the pot rather than just getting uh, the priest part, they took all they could carry. They, all they cared about was people's money, all right? The monies they used at this day and time. You know how God felt about that? He killed them both. God doesn't like that. He wants the primary interest especially of a teacher, to be to teach God's word, not the man's or woman's own word. Verse 35, And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart, that's God speaking in my, and in my mind. There you have both of them. What is in God's mind, that's what he's going to teach. That's what he's going to speak. And, beloved, I'm going to tell you something. If you go to some place that calls itself a house of God and it teaches anything else, I'm sorry, you're wasting your time and probably will be deceived in part. Innocently, no doubt. But when you get away from God's mind, it is he that you must please if you want to have that deed to heaven. Otherwise, you're blowing smoke, wasting time according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure, I want you to underline the word sure, a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Of course, looking forward to Christ. This word sure is to establish, but it's a very... Uh, it's a word that is seldom used in the Hebrew uh, language for, in this uh, power, in this uh, instance. And the word is amen. You've heard people say, say, give me an amen to that, an amen to this, and an amen to that. Well, if it isn't God's word, I'd be careful how I amen it. Right. But the word is amen. But it, I, I want you to really catch this. Now, I want you to document that I am correct by checking your, it out yourself in your Hebrew dictionary. Not right now, but later, okay? Don't, don't show me up here now when I blew it coming out the gate, the, going to chapter 1. No, I assure you this is correct. The word sure here is amen, but it means to build support up. But at the same time, it... It has a second part of tenderness that, if, that um, the English has problems capturing. It, it means to build up 
as a parent or a nurse for a patient would. Can you catch the tenderness in that? When a parent, when a mother, like we just had Mother's Day passed by, you'll never see a greater symbol of love than to see a mother nursing a babe on her lap. You know, rocking it a little if it gets uncomfortable. And, or as a parent to make sure that it's correct, or as a nurse when she knows that someone is ill, she uses the very best of her ability to bring comfort to that patient. Do you understand that that's what God feels about you? And that's part of faith in the promise he has made you. I will make you a sure house and I love you. I nurture, nurture you in this. I intend to pacify you. That means you're going to be happy there. You're going to find contentment. That's why faith is hard to describe in just a few words to bring these emotions that your father places in his promises. How could you help but have faith and love for him when you understand that's how he feels toward you? He said, I want, I want to take you and hold you to myself like a child, for he is your parent. And when you're not well, I want to nurse you as a good nurse would do, to bring you to full health by you absorbing my word. So you see, when he makes that promise of that word, sure, that's the kind of house it is. That's the kind of house he has left for you if, that's that old big word again, if you have faith to believe that. When you take it right down to the prime, it's difficult not to have that kind of faith for someone who cares for you so much. It's a love that is overflowing. A love that, that um, the Father wants to share with you, to provide for you. And as a nurse or a parent, I think that is so beautiful and so complete the very word amen as it is used in this instance which you find seldom used in God's word uh, verse 36 to continue and it shall come to pass not maybe it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him this word crouch in the Hebrew means uh, humbling yourself before royalty okay you're going to he, he's going to seem like royalty to you. It's, uh, it isn't as a slave or a beggar, but from respect and love, knowledge and understanding. To him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. I hope you can see, take that and amplify it into the fact that that Messiah he promised back in verse 35, that priest is our bread. He is the bread of life. And if you're going to teach God's word to believe it, to absorb it, you must partake of that body, that one he sent, which is to say Messiah. Some people will take him and then they kind of sit on it. They kind of fumble with it. That is to say, knowledge, and knowledge fumbled with grows cold, and the embers, rather than being bright, dull, still burn you, but it doesn't make that beautiful sight if you're wanting to see a light. So, in other words, every knee is going to bow to him on the first day of the millennium. Every knee. I look forward to that time, but... Until then, we've got lots of work to do in planning truth. Not our truth, not this man's truth or some other man's or anyone else. But God's word and what God has in his mind brings blessings to you. Why? He loves you as a parent or as a nurse. He wants to care for you. That's just a built-in tendency of one of 
God's children is they want to care for people. That's just a real good trademark there in faith, love, and understanding. Okay, let's, let's go for it. You'll never find a stronger platform than the word sure. As it is used here to understand faith is that promise that he has made to you amplifies that faith that you have thus knowledge increases faith okay let's let's go to second samuel now and if i were looking for an excuse why i messed up and went to the wrong chapter a while ago i could say i've got two samuels together here first and second but i don't make cop outs if you mess up you mess up all right it's too bad sometimes it happens on national television, but that lets people know we're human beings, aren't, does it not? Chapter 7 and verse 13 of this book of uh, Samuel. And again, God's promise, and I'm going to show you that same word again in the Hebrew, but it's going to be used, utilized a little differently in the English. And I insist that you check this out with your strong concordance in the Hebrew Dictionary. Verse 13, God here is talking about building that same house. Now, you know that Christ is the body of the church. Christ is our house. He told them concerning the temple, tear that down and I'll rebuild it in three days. He wasn't talking about a building of mortar. He was talking about the house he would become. The house that God's name would be upon, Yeshua or Jesus, uh, Yahweh's Savior. And knowing and understanding that it's God's promise that he would send someone after you. God promised that he would send someone to comfort you, to protect you, both in the Son and the Comforter. So um, again, verse 13, let's pick it up there, seventh chapter, Second Samuel. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Oh, I love that word, establish. Okay. And for how long? Forever. Don't ever let any man pull you away from that. And don't ever mistake in your mind what God's house is. Verse 14. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now this is talking to David about Solomon, not Christ in this place, all right? But it still looks forward to him. Understand that. It's a promise to David. And naturally, through David would come Christ that, through that genealogy. 15. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul. That would be the first man king whom I put away before thee. God takes down, God moves up. 16, and thine house, sharpen up for me now. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee my throne shall be established for ever now there within one scripture one sentence practically you have house kingdom and throne all in one scripture and in Christ it is all in all and though established is used uh, two times in that verse, only once that would be to read kingdom shall be established is all man. So I, want you, I don't want you to lay that down. Because when he says, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established, amen. That means I'm going to establish a house and a kingdom that with parental love and caring, I'm going to take care of you as long as you are in that house. Now listen to me carefully. This is important. As long as you are in that 
house. Now there are many houses that claim to be houses. You better check them out real good. Because if that parental or that care, that love of a nurse is not there, if you don't feel that nearness of God as he embraces you spiritually, I'm sorry, you're probably not in the right house. It's doubtful that you might even be in the right kingdom because men and traditions of men, like uh, poor old Eli's two boys, I mean, they were good boys, raised up in the priesthood, knew the word, but they had no faith in the word. They didn't believe it. They would rather rip people off, take advantage of them, use them. Why? For their own benefit and pleasure and gain. Now, you can get in a house like that. You, well, how do I know if I'm in a house like that? Well, my mind goes back to Branson. It can't help it at what one of the employees there, stage persons, directors, says, you all are unusual for religious people. Usually when they're having church here, there'll be some dude stand up here and say, I want 10 people that'll give $1,000 standing right here, right now. And he said, y'all don't even pass the plate. You're very unusual. Well, see, what I'm talking about, it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to know if you listen to a man a little bit and all he's trying to do is get in your pocket, really, what's he thinking about? Hmm? I mean, really? He's thinking about your money. If he's taking traditions that pull you into words that are not written in here but are in quarterlies and so forth, that there are quarterlies that, uh, there are quarterlies that align with God's word. You have to discern spiritually. But don't let someone pull you off certain that it's God's house where you feel that love. Because that word established, now like I said, only one of those words in the Hebrew. The other word established there is simply a Hebrew word that means set up without the love, without the tenderness involved with it. But in that one instance concerning the house and the kingdom, he wants you to know that he's going to nurse you there. You know, a nurse will almost lay their life down. I'll never forget in the Marine Corps the nurses we had with us. No rifles, bullets flying. And they would still concentrate on that that they were sworn to uphold was to protect people and human suffering. It's awesome. You run across a few like that or in the States, even in hospitals, as you have people that have that love. It's dedicated. They got a tough go of it. Well, I think God has a tough go taking care of you all sometimes because you can be a little bit hard to take care of. Flipping that light beside the bed, oh God, <laughs> I need a drink of water. Oh God, would you turn my television? Would you bring, you know, uh, they're bad patients in the hospital. I'm using that as an analogy for the way some of you use God. Not you in here, surely. But, you know, like over on the whichever camera, I don't happen to know which one that's doing its bit right now. But sometimes people can do that. You know, there's good patients and there's bad patients. Guess who gets the most blessings? Okay. Because I don't want you to forget the word pacify why now now and that's part of the word faith all right in, especially in the greek pistos is to pacify does god's word pacify you why do you stick a pacifier in a baby's mouth that's kind of a dumb question isn't it well to pacify him of course well that's right well i only use that as an analogy so that you know what god's word is supposed to do for you it's supposed to pacify you or to make you feel sure of yourself and good about your knowledge in him and for him. So, um, again, underline that one word established following kingdom, house and kingdom. 
and check it out for yourself and take it to the prime so that you get the full benefit of God's emotions toward you. You know, to me, I think that's very important. I like to know what God's emotions are to me in his promises and understand we're reading a promise here. Not just passing the time of day. This is a promise from God himself no one else sworn by his own name and it could be sworn to by no greater okay okay let me find myself here verse 17 let's plow on here I think it's important that you know how long forever is that means now also and if you're wondering we're in the Old Testament I wonder if that applies to me forever 17, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Right? A message direct from God. Verse 18, then went King David in and sat before the Lord, and he said, now think about this. David has just received this great promise from God. Listen to David's words. Who am I? O oh Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? In other words, knowing that the Son of God would be born through this lineage. 19. And this was yet a small thing in thy sight, O oh Lord God, but thou hast spoken also of thy servant's house for a great while to come. That means forever. Um, and is this the manner of man? Is, is this the, uh, translate the word manner, Torah, law, okay? Is this the law of, and translate man, ha-adam. It's important, ha-adam. The man, the man through which Christ would come. Important. That's why the flood had to be to protect ha-adam and this lineage of David. Okay. Out of the roots of Jesse, a branch, a stem, a, a, a taproot would come. O oh Lord God. Verse 20. And what can David say more unto thee? Question. For thou, Lord God, knowest thy servant. You know what's in his heart. You, that's one thing you can't con God. You may be able to con people as to how you feel inside and so forth, but uh-uh, not your father. Not when he takes you on his knee and comforts you as a parent would a babe. And you, he, he knows your mind. 21. For thy word's sake. For what? For thy word's sake. That's why you always handle these words carefully. For thy word's sake and according to thine own heart hast thou done all these great things to make thy servant know them. God made his word good. And he lets us know those words if we'll seek. Again, knowledge is part of faith. You must partake of that knowledge and absorb it or your faith is going to be kind of, ah. I wonder. I just wonder if that's could be true. Well, you should study it and you would know. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, yes, God's word is true. God truly loves us. 22, wherefore thou art great, O Lord God, for there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. You get a bunch of pogo sticks out here and people practicing witchcraft and boonies and sexual orgies out in the timber and calling this God, but no, you are the living God because you lead us, you protect us, you show us the way, and you pacify us. We have faith in you. That's what he's saying. 23. And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for a people to himself and to make him a name. And that name again would be Yeshua, Messiah, Yahweh's Savior. And to do for you great things and terrible, awesome is what it should be. For thy land before thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt. 
from the nations of their gods. What do you read from that? God takes care of his own. Do, do you think these people could have escaped from Egypt on their own? No way. I mean, God sent so many plagues upon uh, Egypt. He went after his children. He proved himself. Does that mean anything to you today? Do you think your little troubles today could compare to the millions that were in bondage in Egypt and the armies? They had nothing. And yet God freed them. That promise should mean a lot to you. Should, that's why he repeats it pretty often in the word. 24, for thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. How long? Forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. And he'd better be yours, beloved. The nation Israel, not the house of Judah, but the nation Israel would migrate over many mountains and into many lands. And God would always bless them. I might ask you, which is the most blessed nation in the world today? He said forever. I don't think I even have to answer that, but God's mark is upon his people. Not that he does not also bless the house of Judah. I'm not taking away from that. But I want you to face reality. 25, and now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever and do as thou hast said. For your, for your namesake is what he's saying. What David has kind of said is, Father, I don't know if I'm worthy of all this or not, but if you do, you're going to do it, please do it for your namesake. You know why? Because David was a pretty good sinner. I wonder if any of you are. Well, we all fall short, that's for certain. I guarantee you we do. And that's why we have repentance. And that's why God loves us so much that he's willing to forgive. Make certain that you do not ever forget your part of forgiveness if someone repents to you. If they don't repent, I advise forgiving them in your own heart, but set them aside until they do repent. Uh, 26, and let thy name be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is the God over Israel, and let the house of thy servant David be established before thee. There's the key, the key to David. O thou, for thou, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, hath, hast revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee an house, therefore hath thy servant found in his heart to pray this prayer unto thee. And he could. Do you pray a prayer of thanksgiving to him? Basically, that's what this is. Admitting he's not worthy. And it's a good thing sometimes when, you know, if you haven't repented to recognize the same thing. And now, O Lord God, thou art that God, and thy words be true. You must know that. That's the foundation of faith is to know that that word is true. His word, not man. And thou hast promised this goodness unto thy servant. Therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord God, hast spoken it. And with thy blessings let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. It is. And there are many that would say, well, that just isn't true. God's house is losing, a ten they're losing membership just right and left. And the people are not supporting the church. It's God's house. It's just going to pot and we're going to have to close God's house pretty soon. Now, do you see something wrong with that? I, I don't see any faith at all in someone that would say that. God's promise is it's going to be forever and they're going to have to close it. I think that's some person taking quite a bit upon themselves and showing a great lack of faith. And you know, what is amazing is all they would have to have done. I don't care if it's a shack in Eureka Springs and you're looking at somebody that's been there. I don't care if it's a room in somebody's house in Grove, Oklahoma. I don't care where it is or what it is. If you'll take the word of God there, God's house is there. And it will grow. 
you're looking at it right here. God will build it. But if you don't teach God's word, and if you try to rip off the people, I guarantee you, you deserve to be nothing. Now, I'm just taking a little bit of time there to win friends and influence some people that are having troubles making ends meet in the religious world today, all right? For their benefit there for a moment. Feed the sheep, they'll be there. You got no problem. Feed God's word to God's children and it will pacify them. It will strengthen their faith. And they'll be wonderful children to a wonderful father. He always comes through. Not just part of the time. He always comes through for his elect. There will be a time you're going to have some rough sledding. But you know what he expects you to do? Make that next hill. He's, he's working with you. He knows you can cut it. Therefore, he might put a little more on some than he does others. Why? He knows you've got it. He knows you're made out of good stuff. And you can hack it. So just say, yes, Lord, me. And do it by his word. And you'll always be glad that you did. All right. Let's go to the New Testament. All right. Let's go way over to Hebrews. book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we're going to go to chapter 6. We move here directly now to the word faith. Pistos, pistos in the Greek tongue. And, and it means to pacify when you take it to the prime. To to be convinced beyond a doubt. But I want you prayerfully to know that the word pacify, you have the same tenderness that you do from the word aman in the Hebrew. That he cares, he wants to pacify you whereby you are happy. You have found, in other words, peace of mind. Chapter 6, verse, i tell you what we want to do. I'm going to back up in case you're not familiar with what's happening here. Back up chapter 5. Oh, let's go back to about 12. Um, 11. Of 11, 5, 5, 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. In other words, what Paul is saying, I'd like to teach with a little bit of depth and a little bit of meat here, but all you, you people wouldn't understand it. Why? They didn't have God's word. They had the words of men. Like, are you saved? That's all that's necessary is you just be saved. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You listen to our church and you listen to this preacher. It isn't necessary for you to know God's word. I hope that you're not dull enough that you'd listen to someone like that. That's what Paul is saying here. I got some deeper things to talk about, but there's not a way in this world you'd have the least idea of what I was talking about. All right? And he continues, 12. For, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, as long as you sit in that pew, you should be a teacher. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, I'm going to tell you what. That has come true in this generation, if it ever has in any generation before. And it's real sad. It's not something that certainly that we should boast about. It's just sad. I can't say anything else about it. If you try to have a decent biblical discussion with many Christians, they have not the foggiest idea where you're coming from. Okay. 13, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Let that sink in real good. For he is a babe, never gets past it. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. That means that have matured in the word. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
if you don't exercise your senses, your mind, like you do your muscles, I'm sorry, you're in bad shape. Um, your memory is improved by exercising it. Your memory can be improved greatly in the Word of God or in your school or whatever you're doing by exercising it. You become sharp. I don't care what your age is. And I'm talking about a healthy person, and I'm not talking down to handicapped. You, you understand. Verse chapter 6, verse 1. This is why we came here. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the deeper meat, let us go on unto... I'm um, the... the Basics, let us go on unto perfection. Now, this word perfection doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It means mature. The Greek word absolutely means full age, mature. There's no way you're going to be perfect. Don't, don't look to that. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You don't have to work. You're judged by faith. And I say, show me your faith, and I'll show you a person that works for God. They can't help it, because they love him. That means planting seed or simply being yourself a smile to someone that's really down. It just has a power and raises them up. Verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. In other words, if you do not teach the entire world and all you teach is salvation over and over for 30 years, you got a group pinned up, all of them have been saved and you're going to teach them salvation? That's a sin. It's absolutely a sin to teach salvation over and over to a group that is already saved. It's wasting time. Get into the meat of God's word. Teach the emotions of God. What God had in his mind, that's to say the whole word. The whole truth. Three. And this will we do if God permit. We're going to open your eyes, is what Paul is saying. Four. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, Five, and have tasted the good word of God. I repeat, the word of God. Not a conversion, but have really gone into the knowledge of the word of God and the powers of the world to come. That means the promises of knowing we have a world age coming after this one. And then to go back, follow the subject, then to go back to you got to be, are you, do you love Jesus? Are you saved? Now understand, those are admirable principles, but it's milk. That's only the first step. A baby can make that step. All right. God wants mature people ready to pick up the spiritual sword of the Lord and do battle. If you're not trained, you can't. You can't battle anything. You couldn't fight your way out of a paper sack. Verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Who does the saving? Does a preacher answer? No. Preacher can't save anybody. Well, let me think a minute. Can, the church. Can the church save somebody? Answer? No. Never was intended that the church save anybody. Well, well then who does? Jesus, of course. Now, do you think that when he does his saving that he only does it halfway? Or do you think he's a failure? So, you see, if Jesus does the saving, you better not come around him with that get saved business again. You better get on your knees and repent for the balls in your park. He's already done his work. I don't care how big a sinner you are. Once you're saved, it all hinges on repentance after that. That's why it is a sin to teach salvation only to a group for 30 years over and over that's already saved because you're, in a sense, saying Christ wasn't able and you're trying to re-crucify him all over again. He doesn't like it. 
get into the meat of God's word and give them some knowledge and some meat that will stick to their ribs whereby their lives are strengthened and it will change their lives it will make citizens of God of them whereby they are can do type people hey they can cut it they can get it done so I, I it's rather sad what more can I say I don't want to criticize churches I don't like to criticize churches but I detest so-called men of God that will not teach God's word it just really makes my righteous indignation rise up a little bit because it's the people God's children that suffer because of it therefore what are you going to do you got to do it on your own you have to strengthen yourself by taking I mean after all you can read you're educated get into his word see it for yourself sense it yourself and grow strong in it and you'll never be disappointed all right here let's go just a little further in this verse 7 for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed in other words when they till it and take good care of it it produces receiving blessings from God what God is saying here through Paul is hey where is your fruit are you producing anything if it rains and somebody gets out here and tills it produces a crop now church where is your crop it's kind of what he's saying it's kind of an embarrassing question to some when they're saying we might have to close the doors that's 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 bad God doesn't like that when he gave them the simple plan to nurture as a nurse to treat them as a parent teach them the love of God and get into his word where they can stand up and be somebody and it is sad to say that many times people say yes the Christian must always be poor just paupers are just a mark of the church that's a lie what is the first thing you're taught if you're a good girl or a good boy God will bless you nobody can receive God's blessings and be poor there is no sin in being poor but it is a sin to stay there there are different things that happen in our life that are traumatic and take us to that place but you're not going to stay there God's not going to let you he's just toughening you up for a good scrap further down the road that's what God's Word does for you all right Christians are not supposed to be poor Christians ultimately with God's blessings prosper and that's what it really means here he says uh, he's and he's laying it out there where anyone can understand if you've ever planted a garden hey if if you don't want to work it just let her sit out there and let them old weeds grow and then go out to get your turnips all right you know how many turnips you're going to get not a zero ain't going to be no turnips in the pot why you didn't work at it I think Paul has an excellent way of putting a message across okay so there you got it all right claiming around just teaching salvation and never any meat of God's word and expect to get big turnips oh, shame on you that isn't really what Paul said but that'll get it done okay verse 8 uh, but that which um, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned hey that's pretty serious stuff there beloved if it's not producing fruit if God if a house of God is not producing fruit that's a pretty strong statement there rejected just the next thing to a cursing it's bad mine but beloved we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation the, the, though we th this thus speak 10 for God is not unrighteous to forget now whenever you think you're all alone and you've done so much and it just seems like God isn't nudging you a little bit forward think about this verse listen to it again 
For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Even though you're down and even though you are um, uh, raked over a little bit at times, you still have that good word for the Lord's word. You have a good word for him. Oh man, does God notice that. That even under pressure you produce fruit. That, that, that's going to that's gonna really take you far. Alright? And um, verse 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence, sincerity to the full assurance of hope unto the end. You stick with the truth come a low water or high water. Okay? You stick with it. Don't let some man draw you off to the side. This is the word. God sent it. Who could improve on it? All right? Just simply sharpen up and work the languages. Twelve. That ye be not slothful, a little bit dull, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. That's what it's about is inheritance. A deed. A deed you can hold in your hand, basically, your mind especially, to inherit the promises that God has made. I don't know, you got yours? Getting there, aren't we? Think about it. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Our father did. Saying, surely blessings I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. He has. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham made it. God blessed him when Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100. He produced fruit. Why? He had faith and God counted that as faith. And in closing, turn with me to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which is known as the faith chapter. We're only going to take one or two verses and we're out. We're finished. I want you to listen very closely and you're going to have to, if you wish to follow this through to the fullest, your companion Bibles will help you, but as, as far as the Strong's is concerned, you're going to have to get a little further in the Greek than that, but I'm, your uh, companion will help. Listen to your deed to heaven. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is, you're about to learn what it is here. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. Do you know what evidence is? Evidence is something that will send you up the creek if it happens to be against you and it's bad. In other words, it's a fact. It's evidence. It will stand in court as evidence. Evidence of things not seen. You may not be able to see the promises God has made to you, but they are there. Now, the word substance... That's what I want to talk about. The word sub substance is a legal term in the papyrus that means it is a deed to inherit. That's what the word is utilized as. The word substance that is translated substance in the English is a deed. Your companion Bible, Dr. Bullinger, will back me up on that and you that wish to make deeper study have to it. It's fact. Now let's read it with those words so that you understand that if you believe, if you receive his love as a parent or as a nurse would give that love of caring, then understand that is your ticket. Now here, now faith is the deed, the absolute proven document of things hoped for. The evidence, that deed will stand up. It is the proof uh, of things not seen. In other words, that's your ticket, my friend. Now, the beauty of this is that faith hangs on your belief. Your knowledge, I'm going back to square one where we started. Your knowledge gives you the foundation that builds your faith, your belief in him. And from that, he's going to reach out and take you and set you on his lap. And he's going to nestle you as a little child 
to pacify you into bringing you what it is that he would have you do. Not necessarily what you would like to do, but where he would like to have you. Sometime in his elect's life, they have a hard time understanding just exactly where it is God would have them. Don't worry, he knows he'll get you there. He'll kind of nudge you over a little bit. Have you ever had anybody sit down beside you and they needed a little more room than you had given them and they kind of nussle you over? Well, sometimes God will do that to you. He gives you a little nudge. And sometimes it's just enough if you're not careful, it'll put you off the cliff, you know. But there's something down there he wanted you to go after or he wouldn't have done it. You got to have that faith. That's what faith is to know God is in your life. Pray for understanding and simply, however rough it gets, say, God, use me. Give me understanding. I'm studying your word. I want to find out. Just a couple of verses and we're through. Through faith, uh, for the, by the elders, for by it the elders obtained a good report. They made it known. Three, through faith we understand that the worlds, this is eons, it's ages, the world, do you understand there's three world ages? Of course you do. But do you know how few people know that? And here it is, right here in the Greek, that the world ages were framed by the Word of God. Why couldn't you understand if you study the Word of God then? So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And so it is. That is faith. That is your deed to the kingdom. That is your deed to know that your father cares for you as a caring parent would for a small child or as a nurse would tending a sick patient. Now when you've seen those things and experienced them, they're, they're very touching. But it's a lot more touching when God does it to you. Do you realize he wants to do that for you and to you when you have need of that? Hey, everybody needs a hug occasionally. That's just the way God made us. Why? He's, he's a God of love. He loves us. And he wants you to love him. That documents that he cares for you. Now you may think, ah, can't believe that. Well, you've got a lot of rough miles ahead of you, friend. But someday, do you know what real Christians do with people that shuck off or, sh or shake off God? We let them go to the devil for a while. And the devil makes believers out of them in a hurry. He knows how to get it done. He'll take you so far down in the gutter, he'll burn your brains out with drugs or, or other diseases and have a good trip if you enjoy that sort of thing. God loves his children and he takes care of them. You know something? He wants to give you a pacifier and that's a pacification in love. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings. We thank you for the platform that you have given us to take God, your word to the world, Father. May we be adequate servants in doing so. We ask it in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen.